and manipulator. Tool center point, the picture on the left, and we will actually use TCP, the term TCP, many, many times in this particular seminar. The tool center point is the point where it is exactly in the center of the fingers. You can call it the center of gravity of the fingers themselves while not holding any object. Empty fingers, empty gripper. And the tool center point is extremely, extremely important because this is where we want to bring the robot to. We don't want to move the robot to the X, Y, Z of the actuator of the gripper. We want to move the robot to the X, Y, Z of the TCP, tool center point. And then we we'll open the gripper, if this is a mechanical gripper or electric, uh, electrical uh, driven uh, gripper, we will open it and we will move it so the TCP of the gripping, uh, of the gripper, will be the most, the, the most uh, the proper one to the center of gravity of the object that we want to pick or we, we want to work on. And the arrows indicate on the right hand side, we have again the three uh, axes of the end manipulator of the gripper. And the, each axis has its own, uh, each, I'm sorry, each axis has a task, roll, pitch, and yo. And between that, within these three axes, in this working space of the gripping, we can actually roll, pitch, and yo in order to, to direct ourselves to the TCP equal center of gravity of the object we want to pick up. Again, we are at the end point of the robot where we have fingers. And within that fingers, we have the TCP. And this is the point within the fingers that we need to contact the object that we want to move. So we will roll, pitch, and yo. So to, to, uh, to get to that point where the TCP is where the center of gravity of the object we're picking up. Course level programming something that calls CLP. You will hear me speaking many, many times in this seminar about what we call CLP. Because the process of programming is basically a three, four stage process. The first one is a CLP, course level programming. And a course level programming is still without knowing exactly the shape and the characteristics of the object that we want to work on, I want to move the robot, generally speaking, to the area in space where that particular object will be sometimes in the future. So I'll make a coarse movement. I'm still not taking into account torque problems, velocity problems, time limitations of the process. Nobody is still telling me that, he, that the move has to be 2.5 seconds or 3 seconds. I'm still doing a coarse level programming, CLP which will move the project, it will move the robot, I'm sorry, into a more or less coarse position where one day, one time, an object will be there and I'll have to pick it up specifically. So that's at a coarse level. Now, the second level, we will cover that later in another session, is once I get there, I do a second level programming with the gripper and with the nearby joints, because these joints already did what they need to do, now I have to work on the nearby joints of the gripper. The third level of, of gripping is the joint of the, of, the, of the gripper specifically. So first of all, there's a robot as a whole, then there's nearby joints, then is the gripper joint. These are the three levels. The first one is CLP. Please note that there is a, a base of the offset in what you call the line, the line programming, the skeleton. We, on the right hand side is a skeleton of the robot. And if you look at the left hand side at the structure of the robot, you can understand that there is a base offset, meaning that the center of gravity 
from a geometry point of view of the, of the base motor is not exactly on the home position of the robot. So the home position of the robot is in zero, zero in the plane that the robot is laying on. But the very first motor is offset from that. And it's being represented by this small segment over there. Now, actual coordinate system for robot wrist with roll and pitch compensation. Please keep in mind, when the gripper do its job, it has basically random positions. And when it has random positions, it has not only that random position that we want to analyze, but the joints and the links before that are also in random positions. So gradually and continually, we have a set of joints and links that bring that particular gripper into a random position. It's known, but it's different from task to task. So sometimes the joint and the link before the gripper has their own zero, zero, zero as a reference to the gripper itself. So the gripper itself does not stand on a flat platform, what it called. It stands on a tilted platform. That tilted platform is the platform that was created by the joint and, and links before that. So depending on the position of the joint and that link, this is the reference to the pitch, roll, and yo of the gripper. So that particular uh, uh, schematic um, it tells us exactly the coordinate system of a particular position of the gripper. And we said before that it's extremely, extremely important to hold the subject where the force lines point to the center of gravity. If we do not do that, we might get into a situation when the object will move when the robot moves. This is something we don't want. We don't want the object to move, to change its position as the robot itself do, uh, moves. So it's important to hold a object where the fingers of the gripper all pointed to the center of gravity of that particular um, object. Please keep in mind, there is a um, forward kinetics and there is a reverse kinetics to each end manipulator. Meaning that in this particular object, let's say that in a forward kinetics, we go and uh, put that particular um, item under some water uh, faucet, and then once it gets to be under the water faucet, water will start getting inside. And it will fill up this particular small container. So when we go to, the, um, to be under the faucet, to be filled up with water, then we are in the forward kinematics. We are forward going there. But that particular small container is empty. It has its own particular center of gravity and its all particular weight because it's empty. Once it gets filled up with water, its param the parameters change the weight, and when we rotate it, obviously the center of gravity. So there's a forward kinetics and there's a reverse kinetics because when we have to move this filled up uh, container with water from point B to point C, then the fingers might change a little bit. So when we take it empty, the configuration will be one, and when we take it full, the configuration will be two because of different physical characteristics of the object. And in order to prolong what we call the lifespan of the robot, and in order to reduce the what we call LCC, the life cycle cost of the robot, taking into consideration the forward kinetics compared to reverse kinetics will minimize the, pro the mechanical and electrical problems uh, of the robot itself as a machine. And in these particular three pictures, 
we see specifically on the right hand side that it's presented in orange red type of uh, color. That means that on the gripper itself, once that container is filled up with water, there's much more weight on the joint of the, of, of the gripper, meaning um, uh, in a finite analysis um, uh, uh, process, we will find out that there's a stress in this particular joint, and when we will move it, having a container with water, bigger weight, we will actually create some forces and might, might damage the small motors of the, um, of the gripper itself. So what we want to do, we want to get as close as we can to the picture on the right. In the reverse kinetic, when the container is full with water, we want to an analyze every single path, no matter if they reverse or forward kinetics, not to have a weak point and not to have a stress point on any one of the nodes. That will make the operation stable and that will minimize the life cycle cost of the robot. And this is another presentation of articulated robot when we want to deal with degrees of freedom. And every single joint, now that we understand what are joints and the links, there is another way of presentation having a small seal in there representing the joint itself and the uh, rotation of the angle of that particular joint. And what we can see that every single joint have its own characteristics of the cylinder associated with it. Please keep in mind the, uh, the base of the robot, it has two cylinders. Cylinder number one that has a rotational angle number one and cylinder number two that has rotational number, uh, uh, angle number two. And it's on the same motor. So motor working this way, a motor is working this way. So there will be two cylinders when we talk, when we talk about degrees of freedom. And just to get a, a feel of the number of degrees of freedom for uh, related to a humanized robot. Compared to a classical six degree, six degree of freedom articulated robot, here we have 25 degrees of freedom. And the reason that we have so many degrees of freedom over and above an industrial uh, robot is because we need to go beyond our back above our head, below our feet. We need to touch every single place and we need to be very precise in every position. So we need a large number of degrees of freedom in order to have a, an ability to get to any second point in our working envelope at the same accuracy, something very, very important to note, even if it's behind the robot um, uh, facade, what you call, which the industrial robot cannot do. Different geometry is for a SCARA robot. A SCARA robot is basically a flat robot that has joints and at the end there is um, a gripper. It has, as we, said, as we learned in the previous uh, session, uh, in the beginning of the course, we learned the entire working envelope of a SCARA robot, but here is the geometry of two links and three joints. And please note that this particular schematic is where we have a vertical axis on node number one or node number no, node minus one, while we have a tilted axis in the reference node axis n and another tilting axis on the node n plus one. Keep in mind, we make, a, we make a reference node. This will be n. Something closer to the base is n minus one, closer to the gripper is n plus one. And in this particular SCARA robot, I want to point your attention that every single node, although by the classical definition, SCARA robot is basically a flat robot, Every single node has its own uh, tilted angle. And this is the geometry associated with each tilt leg, leg, uh, uh, angle of each joint. 
And this is just a summary of the home position of a robot, although we discussed about it before. But it's a very clear picture that we have an external home and we have an internal home. Again, just one word about it. Internal home is the home based, is the zero, zero, zero of the home base of the robot itself as a machine. External home is the zero, zero, zero home base of the environment where which the robot is operating at. And up until now, we talked about 2D and 3D Cartesian system. And here we look at polar coordinates uh, geometry. And a uh, polar coordinate geometry basically has two rules and it depends on the applications. In a robotic application, the zero is where east direction is. And when we have the zero direction, uh, the zero direction at east, in the robotic application, the angle is counter is a, a counting counterclockwise. As opposed to navigation application, when the zero pointing north and the angle going clockwise. So in robotics, keep in mind, is opposite to navigation. Because we start talking about polar, we have a cylindrical uh, sch uh, uh, schematic of, um, of a robot. Easily we can see the telescopic arm where which the, the gripper is at the tip, at the end, and we can see the working area. And the working area of that particular robot is where the telescope is starting from. The cylinder telescope is all the way in compared to the telescope all the way out. And the end of the working envelope is where the end of the gripper, the tip of the grippers, the tip of the fingers. So this is the 2D and 3D uh, Cartesian coordinate system in a polar environment. And very similar to uh, a polar coordinate geometry, it has a spherical type of robot. And all what we do, we just change this uh, telescope. We actually can shorten it, we can prolong it, we can make it longer, and the tip will, will be the end of the working envelope. This is only, has, the difference is that it has two angles compared to a single angle in the cylindrical one. So spherical one, in terms of the geometry, has one additional angle, and this is the angle of the telescope itself.